So, it, you know, St. Dogbert here is, is, is going around kind of bashing programmers because they often do very strange and funny stuff and trying to remove that. Um, we also spend a lot of time helping programmers not do strange and funny things. Uh, what do developers need to do for multi-core? What do they need to do for quick sync video, mainstream gaming, and ABX? Well, as you guys probably know, for Intel has been talking a lot about multi-core. The number of systems in, in the industry shipping that have multiple cores is growing. Uh, the gray there is the single core, the yellow is dual, green is quad, and blue is more than four cores. So as you can see, uh, quad cores are picking up significantly, and the greater than four cores are growing as well, uh, whereas the number of single cores is <coughs> significantly shrinking. So, what does that mean for developers? Well, I'm not going to... Sorry, question. Yeah, before you go on into developers, what's the fundamental difference I3, I5, and I7. What is the fundamental difference between I3, I5, and I7? Okay, so the question is, what is the fundamental difference between core I3, core I5, and core I7? Um, the fundamental difference, well, from a marketing messaging perspective, what Intel will tell you is that core I5 is better than I3, performs better and more capability, and core I7 is better than I5. Uh, the way I would look at it is Core i7 is a little is more the higher end, so you have all the capabilities on the platform. Core i3 starts off with the basic microarchitecture and capabilities, generally two core versions, where Core i5 is four core versions and above. Uh, you'll see support for turbo as well. And then Core i7, you see higher frequencies. Uh, you also see support for something called AES to advance uh, encrypted instructions, uh, meant to accelerate encryption and various types of uh, photography solutions. Can you be nice to call I2, I4, and the number of cores they've got? Why didn't we call them Core I2, I4, I6? I'm not marketing, so I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no, it's two cores, yeah, but you think it's got three cores in it because it's called. It. I I'll tell you an interesting story. My wife works at Intel in marketing. And it's pretty interesting because she tells me if I understand the, the advertisements or the marketing, then it's probably a mistake on their part. <laughs> because she said, I'm not the target. Um, Intel, when I said we launched volume and mainstream, you know, this is millions of processors aimed at the, at the entire market. Whereas somebody like myself, I'm more of an early adopter, I'm going to build my PC. So any of that marketing messaging and communication isn't necessarily targeted for me directly. Um, so I think I3 and I5 and I7, from what I understand, is easier for end users to understand. Especially for BMW. Sorry? Especially for BMW. Especially for BMW. I can't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason for the question is that when I look at PCs that are uh, laptops that are being sold today, uh, the i3s and i5 seem to be two core machines, and the only ones I see that be four core machines are the i7s. So that's that's changing in the second generation, so that i5s will be four core now as well. Okay, so uh, from, a, uh, uh, and from a marketing point of view, uh, I do not see the cores, the number of cores, as being uh, an argument for selling the PC. You see the they tell me all about <coughs> the, the size of the disk, uh, the, uh, the speed of the processor, but they never mention the number of cores uh, as a marketing mm -hmm. in the store. And so that's, that's, a, that's an issue, a question, why? I don't, I don't think I have an answer, I don't know. Um, uh, you want me to ask, talk afterwards, I can see if we can find the right person. Well, well, this is a general question. Yeah. We are pushing cores, cores. Well, actually, if you look at it, um, the naming switch when we went from Core i3 to Core i3, i5, and i7 happened in the, in the last generation, right? So what we call the first generation of core. Before that, we used to have Core 2 Duo, Core 2 Quad. 
And those brand names reference the number of cores directly. Um, now, I can't say why, mostly because I don't know that Intel made that switch, but it makes sense that there's a gap between people's understanding of cores versus something as simple as core i3, i5, i7. Some of the stuff like that, so the statement was it says that the software doesn't run very well on more than more than one core. I think it's a mixed job. Um, I think there's a lot of software that does quite a bit, right? I mean that's what I spend all my time making sure it happens. That there's a lot more software that does multiple cores. And if I look at all the games that I work with, there's nobody that doesn't perform well on two cores. And there's a large percentage of them that already work well on four cores. Um, I'm worried about the beyond four cores part, right? If somebody wants to figure out how to get from one to two, <coughs> that's pretty well understood in, in, in the ISP industry that I work with. Right. It's, it's old the applications that you're used to and you're happy with, and suddenly you have to get the latest release because it doesn't run so fast any longer. Okay, well, let, we can talk about it a little bit more. Let me move on a little bit here. Can um, I just ask a question? Sorry. Can I just, sorry. Yeah. Do you have, um, are you doing processes with more than four cores? Are we doing what? Processes with more than four cores. Yes, we have one out already for the last year. Which is? Uh, it's goes by the code name of Gulftown. It was called the Core i7 Extreme on the desktop. It has six cores, 12 threads, so six cores with hyper threads. So six, six physical cores. Yep, six physical cores, 12 logical threads. We just yeah. introduced the 10 core last week, wasn't it? Sorry? The 10 core? Yes, sorry, and 10 cores on the server, of course. Um, well, these are on production servers. Yeah, yeah. You go and buy them now. Yep. Okay, so going back to the quick sync. So one of the, the challenges the developers started talking to us about was well we were adding all this hardware capability into the CPU to do video encoding and decoding. It was getting harder and harder for them to continually program for it because we kept adding new capabilities into each successive processor. So we went back and created something called the Intel Media SDK. And it's meant to abstract some of the, or quite a bit of the video algorithms. Now why is that useful for software developers? It means that they can program to the SDK API and then automatically get the benefit of both the current hardware and the previous generation hardware, but also the future generation hardware as it comes out. So we will update the media SDK as we bring out new pieces of hardware that have more hardware acceleration. So that makes it easier for them to port over. The likes of CyberLink and InterVideo have been very, very, very happy with our solution so far. And you'll see a lot of them that use that directly. Um, let's move on just a little bit forward. Okay, so programming for games. Uh, the Visual Adrenaline site is, this is our, our website where we talk about how to, how to program games for our platform. Uh, specifically for the second generation core, we've got a lot of uh, pointers for various <coughs> tools that you, you guys have seen and how they work with our games ISVs. We've also got a lot of pointing to forums and community. Uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is showing case studies of games that can run on our platform. Uh, because we've had such a history of not being able to run games in a, in a performant manner, we spend a lot of time now showing people just how capable the platform is. So you'll see a lot of case studies and videos of, of current games that run there. And one of the tools that we use um, is called a Graphics Performance Analyzer. Okay, This is a, a, a tool that's a little bit different from the set of tools that you guys are working with. It's focused for a smaller community of developers and it's primarily focused on profiling the graphics part of the CPU, okay? And so the game developers that we work with get a lot of benefit out of using that. Okay. 
ABX. So a little bit more about ABX, we talked about it, it increases the, theoretically you can increase the performance by 2x. Practically in a real application, probably anywhere from 1.2 to 1.6. Uh, it's available on all of our Sandy Bridge systems, right? So this is mainstream volume availability, and it will be available on the servers by the end of this year. Okay. Uh, and how do you take advantage of it? Well, this is the best part. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it here because the talk this afternoon will talk about this as well. Basically, programmers have a couple of options. One is to go more to the metal, so to speak, and use intrinsics or assembly. Intrinsics is by far the better way to, to work. And that works both with the Microsoft compiler and with the Intel compiler. Um, although, I, you know, my experience, the Intel compiler does a better job of, of optimizing the intrinsics. And then also the rest of the Intel tools. So the libraries like I, uh, Intel Performance Primitives, uh, Math Kernel Library all have optimizations for AVX. The compiler itself can generate AVX code and does a, a really good job of that as well. So there's, a, there's really a handful of solutions from homegrown, the developer can do it themselves, to, and that's a lot of work, to the tools which enable them to do it a lot easier and a lot more um, efficient. Uh, practically what I see some developers do, by the way, is they'll start off with something like a compiler, and they'll use that to do the auto vectorization, and they'll get a few things going with AVX, and that gets them through sort of the learning curve a bit. And eventually, if they decide that they need further performance beyond that, they might take that and go into an intrinsics as well. Okay. But it, it's an incremental investment because you can use the compiler to do the AVX optimization first, get some benefit right off the bat, some experience, capability, and then if you need to go a little bit further, you can move into intrinsics. Could I ask? Um, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, how does AVX work as opposed to multi-threading? I mean, is it about whole corporations on similar types of data? Uh, this is a good question. How does AVX work versus multi-threading? So programmers have to make a good decision about decomposition in terms of data parallelism and, and general concurrency. So they actually are one in this, they're similar, right? You can do the process with multiple threads, or you might be able to do the, uh, well, let's take a real example. Let's say you have to add 100 uh, numbers. You have 100 numbers and you need to add them all up, okay? Now, I could take one thread for each number or one thread for each two numbers and add them and then kind of do that concurrently. I could also take AVX and say add eight of them at a time, right? Okay, and for 100 numbers, you know, the AVX route is probably going to be better. But let's say I had maybe 100 million numbers that I wanted to add. Then what a, what a smart developer would do is they would use both concurrency and AVX. Right? They would use AVX to get eight numbers added at a time, but they would then divide that 100 million uh, numbers up by the number of cores that they have as well, so that you have all of your cores processing AVX in parallel. They get a much higher computer throughput. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Generally, if um, <coughs> you need to look at both, there are trade-offs for each of them. Right? Threading can sometimes have a higher cost to get going, so you need a certain amount of granularity. The problem has to be a certain size for it to be applicable. Uh, whereas that, that threshold for AVX is a little bit lower. But you know, if you can't use just AVX for 100 million numbers on one core. Okay. okay. So we're here to the summary. Uh, we're going to get you excited about the, the second generation core processor. <coughs> The things you want to remember about it is it's a completely new architecture, a new new brand identifiers to help you identify them from previous. It's it's got Turbo Boost technology, which is significant in that you can increase the frequency depending upon the utilization of the CPU. It's got integrated graphics directly into the die. That means you can run a lot more capable games and graphics than you could before. And it adds AVX instructions, which allows for a higher level of data parallelism than we've had before as well. Okay. Are there any questions? Is, is AVX uh, capable of double computations 
Also, is AVX capable of double computation? Um, I believe so, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Double precision. Yeah, sorry? Double precision. Yeah. Um, to, to be fair, so AVX1 currently does single precision and double precision. Uh, it does not do integer currently. So a future version of AVX will add integer support. Are we in danger of getting a digital divide here in that the latest process is so advanced that when people take advantage of them for their advanced applications, those applications will no longer run on older, smaller, single processor networks, things like that, therefore forcing people to operate. And I'm having this quite a large population of fairly wooden machines out there. Um, that people are needing to buy on. Um, as you're increasing the capabilities of these advantages, people can start using them. Is there any way to the applications not actually compatible with the early generations of machines? Is it going to make the applications, because we keep moving forward, are we going to make it not backwards compatible? Well, it, it's going to be always going to be somewhat backwards compatible. It's actually, if you look at the history, we spent an extreme amount of effort making it backwards compatible. <coughs> If you go talk to a CPU architect these days and you told him he didn't have to be backwards compatible, he probably had to throw a party. Um, you can still run you know, six, seven, eight, nine year old code. Um, that. Now the question for a developer, uh, if, would they end up writing code that wouldn't run? Well, the answer is it doesn't make business sense for them to do so. A perfect example is uh, I do a lot of programming processing. Uh, I've just given up on using um, the photographic code products I use on the desktop to do it seriously on the network I carry around with me because it won't, won't run those applications. So I've got um, two worlds. I have cheap, low capability applications which are a bit of a nuisance and I have to use them family. And I've got advanced supportive ones I use as I can help get my desktop. Yep. And you're going to have that. I mean, networks are not designed, the primary usage model is in doing something like other web thing. Uh, any kind of advanced mode. Whereas your usage for networks is significantly different. Right? You, want, you want the one device that does them all. Well, I want people to be able to write programs that perhaps reduce the number of the amount of functionality, but do some things well enough to run a small box. Well, that's a question you have to ask the software developer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect that, well, I know that there are many software developers that do, but I suspect it's a business question. I, I don't know that I can answer that easily. No. Yeah. Question. Is there any way to use your, your on-die GPU for general programming, for example, with OpenCL or something like that? Can you use the on-die GPU to use uh, general purpose computing? Uh, yes. Um, can you do it through OpenCL? Uh, not currently. Um, not, you could imagine that that would, that would be something that would work in the not too distant future. Uh, you can do HLSL general computation already, right? Take HLSL, um, and there's a whole bunch of codes that are all done in HLSL anyways. Uh, you could do that. Uh, interesting, interestingly though, the GPU still doesn't have the, the compute capability that the, the general CPU cores do. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a significant difference, like an order of magnitude. But for something which was a very iterative, simple bit of processing, that might make sense. Yeah, it. and what's even more interesting is yeah. if you could use both at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Question. Does your graphics unit support OpenGL? Does the graphics unit support OpenGL? Yes. Okay. Is the graphics unit itself multi-core? Is the graphics unit itself multi-core? Um, Depending on how you use the terminology multi-core, I would say yes. It has 12 execution units. Okay. Now, is that a core, a core in the same, one, same sense that an x86 core is? No. But, you know, if you then look at other GPU vendors and the way that they define cores, yes, there are multiple of those cores. Uh, but you have to remember, not all cores are equal. So when, when a, a GPU vendor says they might have you know, 128 cores, 
those aren't the same cores as an x86 core, nor is the GPU core that we have. Even amongst the two other GPU vendors, their cores are very different from each other. Question? Okay. Is that a 12 execution comes in i3 or i7? The 12 execution comes in on the HTG3000. Uh, which is on both the i3 and the i5, uh, and the i7, depending on the SKUs. Yeah. The HDG 2000 has six execution units, so roughly half the performance. Uh, can you turn off the GPU and use uh, the screen part of the GPU? Yep. And actually, what you'll see in a lot of the laptops that come out with 10 years now, they come out with Core i7, and they have uh, the integrated GPU, HDG3000, and a discrete card. And so what most of the vendors that we work with do is they switch between the two. So for the majority of the office applications that you may use, they just use the integrated GPU, because the power consumption is quite a bit less than the discrete card would be. Whereas, let's say you turn on your Adobe Photo Effects or you start playing a game, then it can switch over automatically to the discrete GPU. Thank you very much.